My name's Peter French. Um, I'm here tonight with just a very small role, that of introducing our two illustrious guest speakers. Before I do that, however, I'd like to extend to everyone who's joined us online a very, very warm welcome. I know how difficult it is sometimes, people talk to me about this, to motivate oneself in these times of lockdown. So thank you all for making the effort. And I'm absolutely certain you'll be more than amply rewarded by what you have to hear and see this evening. Um, just to give you some forewarning of the structure of the evening, I'll talk for just a few minutes, perhaps five minutes by way of introduction to the speakers, after which um, the first of the two speakers, Stephen Buckley, will come in. Uh, Dr. Stephen Buckley is a member of the Department of uh, Archaeology here in the university, and he will set the scene to the talk. He'll talk about the, the practices and life in, in ancient Egypt and mummification, the tombs, etc. cetera. Um, Stephen will probably talk for about, about 15 minutes, after which David Howard will come in um, and take over um, and talk about the generation of the voice by way of digital technology, how they recreated the ability of the, the mummy to speak. It's a very interesting piece of research from my point of view. I mean, I think it's absolutely fascinating how anybody could actually recreate the speech of a man who's been dead uh, 3,000 years or so. And it's also very fascinating, not just from the point of view of the content, but from the point of view of the methodology. I mean, this must be one of the pieces of research, the single piece of research that absolutely epitomizes the value of crossed interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, I don't know what the current buzzword is, cooperation. In other words, academics liaising with other academics and cooperating across subject boundaries. Um, I'm not going to talk about the research itself. As I said earlier, I'm just here to talk about the speakers. And the speakers themselves are both very, very good examples of people who have moved across discipline boundaries, subject boundaries in the course of their, their careers, their academic journeys. Um, in fact, I'd say each one in, the, in his own way is a paradigm example of uh, the, the Renaissance polymath. Stephen is currently a welcome fellow in bioarchaeology in the Department of Archaeology at York. And he's also a fellow uh, at the University of Tübingen in Germany. He began his career not in archaeology or bioarchaeology at all, but as a chemist, graduated from Sheffield University with a chemistry degree after which he spent around 10 years in the National Occupational Health Service, which was one of the forerunner organizations that monitored people's health in the workplace. And in that context, he was uh, involved in, uh, I think, well, a number of years in examining blood and urine samples of employees for evidence of uh, clinical expo uh, sorry, chemical exposure and also chemical contamination. I think Stephen's turn, turning point was in 1990 um, when he went on holiday to, to Egypt in a way to fulfill a, a childhood dream to be able to see Egypt and to, to see at first hand the results of the ancient civilization. And it was in that context that he conceived the idea of turning his skills in analytical chemistry towards um, bioarchaeology. In other words, he became very interested in the mummification uh, process, and not just in the process, but also in the, the use of different agents, in particular naturally occurring uh, chemical agents for um, de um, preventing invasion of the, the, the mummified cadavers by uh, biomicrobes and also by insects. Um, his approach to his work isn't, hasn't only been an analytic one, though. I think he's also a fine example of what's in some areas of science are known as a proponent of analysis by synthesis. In other words, if you want to know how something works, um, what you do is you go and make one yourself. And it was in that context, before he was heavily involved in academic work, that he turned his hand to mummification of pigs 
in the garden shed. He went on from there to mummify a taxi driver called Alan Billis from Torquay, who was a man who was dying of terminal cancer, who uh, volunteered his body for mummification. And this was all before devoting his efforts to Nessie Amun. Um, in fact, I think the, the earlier involvement with uh, the mummification of the taxi driver led to an academic article or an article in a chemistry magazine which had the most improbable title of any academic article I've ever, ever heard of, which was Why I'm Mummified a Taxi Driver. So that's, that takes a bit of beating. David Howard, who I've known for very, very many years, more than I care to remember, um, again has moved across di disciplinary boundaries. He began his academic journey studying um, ele electrical and electronic engineering at University College in London after which he moved sideways slightly to an academic position in experimental phonetics. In 1990, he moved from London to York and to the Department of Electronics here, where he gained a personal chair in music technology and for many years served as head of that department. In 2017, we sadly lost him to Royal Holloway in London, where he was invited to set up the, the new Department of Electronic Engineering and to become head of it. Over the course of his career, he's been very, very heavily involved in research, in singing, voice production and in voice perception, and more lately in vocal track modeling. Outside of work, um, you meet lots of people who know a David Howard and they all think they know a different David Howard. They'll say things like, well, the David Howard I know is involved in choral singing. And other people will say to me, well, the David Howard I know was the organist at St. Olive's Church in York. And others will say, well, this isn't the David Howard who used to play the organ in York Minster. And yet others will say, well, not, not the ex-naval officer David Howard and the accomplished sailor. Well, in fact, they're all the same man. So without further ado, I'll hand, you, I'll hand you over now to our two Renaissance polymasks. Stephen. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Um, so yes, I'm just going to um, uh, tell everyone about a little bit about uh, Nezia Moon and his life uh, before David uh, um, uh, shows us the, uh, the ex exciting part of the research, if you like. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of context, just to show that um, you've actually been looking at mummies um, for uh, quite some time now. The York uh, Mummy Group um, started in 1999 um, with Don Brothwell and uh, Professor Don Brothwell and uh, Professor Joan Fletcher and myself. Um, and so we've actually uh, looked at quite a few mummies in, in various ways. Uh, as a chemist, which is what I am primarily, but also uh, with the imaging. Um, and this brings us to um, Nezia Moon. This is his coffin um, in Leeds Museum. Um, and I just want to thank Leeds for um, their support and, uh, and also some of these images here. Uh, he's a very interesting individual, Nezia Moon. Here you see him uh, in his coffin in Leeds Museum um, on display. And he's quite a special individual uh, in, in, a, in a number of ways. Uh, he was actually the first Egyptian mummy uh, to be studied in, in interdisciplinary uh, manner. Um, three surgeons and a chemist were part of the study in 1824 and the research was published in 1828. This is Nezia name. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that later, uh, given the importance of the name. Um, but this is his name in hieroglyphs, Nezia Moon. And the, um, interestingly, this here is um, a tongue. So interesting that his tongue uh, protrudes, but also uh, clearly part of what this research was about was trying to ultimately um, regain his speech, which obviously where the tongue is a significant part. So, to give you some 
about him. We, he was also chosen because we knew something of his life, something of his background. He wasn't an, an anonymous mummy. Um, and so his name means uh, the one belonging to the God of Moon. And he lived in, in Thebes, modern Luxor, uh, during the 12th and 11th centuries BC. Uh, quite an interesting time. Um, and his coffin inscriptions reveal that he served as a priest at the great state temple of Karnak. Uh, and most likely was a son of a priest, uh, since offices uh, were usually here and mostly part time. Uh, his official titles also reveal he was a scribe, uh, presumably educated at a temple school, um, to become uh, one of the um, less than 1% of Egypt's literate population. And yet some aspects of his working life are perhaps unclear. Um, although it's possible that he was one of the tw uh, 1025 permanent staff employed uh, within Karnak temples, uh, multiple shrines, uh, others have suggested um, that he didn't have continuous duties and he only uh, worked uh, three months of the year. So one month on, three months off, which, which many did. Um, and this means that for the remaining nine months, he must have had other employment. And while there's no ever, uh, information on his coffin, there is a possibility um, that he may be the same Nessie Amun, um, who was um, a Medje, a police chief working on the West Bank of Thebes and living near Medinet Habu. Uh, um, and in terms of what we know of Nessie Amun, allowing him to speak for himself, uh, figuratively as well as literally, then some previous studies um, have provided some information on him. Um, that he was around five foot six, um, also described um, as well proportioned and clearly Nubian blood had once coursed through his veins, was a comment from uh, Richard Neve, who did a, a facial reconstruction of Neziamu, which is now displayed in Leeds Museum. Um, and previous examinations also suggested in life um, he had um, a cough, supposedly, and tooth problems, uh, neck pain, um, early osteoarthritis in his left hip, uh, which is something I share with him, I have to say. Um, in addition to um, uh, parasitic worms, um, and, the, and um, that would have caused his body to swell dramatically, uh, is the suggestion. He died uh, middle-aged, so perhaps as old as in his mid-50s, which was actually quite an age in ancient Egypt. The average lifespan was around 35, uh, so he actually survived quite some time. Um, and this is Luxor, uh, this is a, oh, sorry, uh, this is the um, River Nile. Um, separating the East and West Bank. And here you have the famous Valley of the Kings where the Egyptian pharaohs of the New Kingdom were buried. Um, and the latter part of that was, was Nezia Moon's time. Um, and here you have Karnak Temple. So you have the, the precinct of Montu um, and the precinct of Amun where Nezi Moon would have worked. And on the um, West Bank, you have Der al Bakri, um, the Temple of Hatshepsut, where around here, his um, mummy was discovered in 1823. And if he's the, um, the Medjay, the police chief then, um, he may have lived around here, Madinat Habu as well. So this is um, Thebes, uh, East Bank, Karnak, just a, a closer view of it, where you've got the priest, precinct in Montu and the precinct of um, Amun-Ra. And uh, he was known to be a priest who, um, according to the inscriptions, 
um, his role involved um, pleasing the gods, um, Amun, um, and um, consort Moot and, and Sun Kamsu, um, but also Montu and um, Osiris and uh, the Arten uh, earlier in New Kingdom. It's also worth saying that he lived during turbulent, turbulent times, uh, and he's the only mummy in coffin securely dated to the reign of Ramesses XI, who reigned um, 1099 to, to, to 1069 BC, uh, at a time when um, Egypt divided in two, north and south, so the north-south divide. Um, and uh, the south was then controlled by the, the priests who became so-called priest kings, uh, and the, the pharaohs, the kings, just ruled in the north. Uh, so it was a time of turbulence, um, and also a time when the uh, priests at Karnak um, needed um, wealth, gold, to um, maintain their position. Um, and given that Nubia, where the gold normally came from, was no longer so easily accessible, um, one of the things they did, which I'll come on to again briefly, is um, basically um, strip the uh, mummified royals, the pharaohs, um, of their gold, uh, much of which was melted down. Uh, and it's also worth saying that um, during this time, it uh, would have affected Nezia Moon's life, as you'd expect. Um, and actually there's evidence of this from uh, the um, wood, which would have normally been cedar wood from Lebanon uh, for his coffin, but um, those trade routes were restricted because of the um, political upheaval. So actually sycamore wood was used. Um, and for the, 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 um, the occult statue god, um, that was necessary uh, to use cedarwood rather than, sorry, use uh, sycamore rather than cedarwood. Uh, and so, as I say, uh, interesting times with um, the evidence there from, from Nezia Moon's uh, coffin. And also interesting in the same connection with Nezia Moon's surviving clothing, um, which um, had been uh, heavily darned. So again, reflecting um, the uh, conditions at the time. This is just showing a, a close-up of the West Bank, where again, this is where he would have been buried um, and possibly worked at Medin Med Med Abu. And you also have the, the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens. Um, and so living in um, what was an extremely interesting part of Egypt in during the New Kingdom, which was the high point in Egyptian culture, um, albeit at the end of that, and as I say, quite a turbulent time. Um, and you can see here nicely the relationship between the complex at Karnak um, and um, the causeway. Um, that connected Karnak and um, Der el Bakri. And it's worth saying that um, Karnak is a very significant place, so the place where Nezi Amun worked. It actually became the world's largest religious structure covering 247 acres uh, and made up not only of religious sh shrines, as you might expect, uh, but also granaries, library, school, and medical center, as well as many other uh, functions as well. So it was really the heart of the community. And by around uh, 1150 BC, Karnak employed around 80,000 people from not only the clergy, uh, and musicians, but clerks, police, barbers, wig, wig makers, weavers, bakers, 
perfume makers, uh, and the farmers and florists and butchers and fishermen who work the temples, 770 square miles of arable land. So a very powerful institution um, that Nezia Moon was part of. Um, and as I say, he served Amun, as his name suggests. Um, but um, most of his titles relate to God's father of Montu Ra. So very much a focus on Montu. Uh, and suggesting that his main duties focused on the Montu complex located in North Kana. Uh, this is interesting given what was happening at this time. Uh, because as well as maintaining its ritual purpose, the Montu temple became the place where the trials of the tomb robbers were carried out during the reign of Ramesses the Ninth. Um, presumably, it's said because of the uh, emphasis on truth at this shrine. And this makes Nezimun's Nezi role at the Montu temple especially interesting uh, because he's the only individual known to have held the title scribe of the temple uh, of the temple of Montu Ra, uh, making him overseer of both ritual texts and trial records, a role which also allowed him to sit on legal councils, and he would also have had uh, uh, made um, frequent visits to Karnak's um, House of Life uh, library, in other words. And as far as his burial is concerned, it um, lay within the causeway area of Dar el Bakri. Which you can see here, so which lies directly opposite Karnak in the foreground, as I said. Um, and as a site dedicated to the goddess Hathor, Der el Bakri was used um, for the royal funerary temples of both Mentuhota II and Hatshepsut, uh, both significant pharaohs. And since both temples were closely associated with a moon, and Manta, Mentuhotep's um, also with Montu, obviously, um, it, as a result, it became the burial ground of many Theban clergy priests by the 20th dynasty around 1100 BC, again around Neziamun's time. Um, and yet the site was subject to serious rock falls which covered the original temples and tombs, um, as did a later Christian monastery called the Northern Monastery, um, which is Deir al Bakri in Arabic, and that gives it its current name. And then what's worth saying um, as a slight twist is that um, his mummy was found in 1823, Nesimu's mummy. Uh, but in 1891, uh, the Abdel Rasul, um, Rasuls who are a famous family in that part of the world, very much connected with uh, locating mummies and exploiting Egyptian royal mummies. Uh, alerted the Cairo authorities to a sealed rubble covered shaft tomb, which you can see here, uh, located at the northern end of um, Hatshepsut's temple, which you can see um, in the picture here, that's Hatshepsut's temple, and this was the shaft tomb that was uh, mentioned. Um, it's actually known as, now known as Bab el Gesus, which is uh, Gate of the Priests, uh, 14 meter vertical shaft. Uh, but a burial chamber containing 153 coffins of 21st dynasty priests and priestesses of a moon um, who are collected together. And um, interesting because this is in 1891, the tomb was cleared. Uh, and the only um, thing we have on this happening is actually this um, watercolor by Marianne Brocklehurst of Macclesfield. Uh, in her diary as she toured Egypt. Um, but the relevance here um, is that 
most of the coffins um, were kept in Cairo. Um, many of the mummies ended up um, being dispersed, as many were at that time. Uh, but it's also suggested that um, this was the place where Nezi Amun came from, despite the fact that he'd actually been found um, 70 years earlier. So a nice trick. Um, and again, going back to his time, this was the time of the high priest at Karnak, where Egypt had split into north and south. And the south, based with its capital at Thebes, uh, the high priests were controlling um, that part of Egypt. But as I said, they needed um, gold to maintain their status. And this is actually a papyrus, a letter um, to a scribe, Uta Hammond, ordering him to go and perform a task on which you have never before embarked, uncover a tomb among the tombs of the ancestors. And so the high priest is basically saying, uh, uh, rob the royal mummies of their wealth um, so that we can maintain our power is the gist. And so this is what they did. They were traveling um, to the Valley of the Kings along the paths that you can see in the slide above. Uh, there are many paths, it's quite complex, and these are paths I've traveled myself in my work um, excavating one of the tombs in, in the Valley of the Kings, KV39. Um, and it's interesting because one of the things these priests did was not only strip the valuables from the royals, but they also rewrapped them as part of this process. And there's a so-called high place uh, where this happened. And... Um, the best candidate, the most likely candidate for that, is KV39, um, where we've excavated and where they were rewrapped. And you can see a rewrap mummy here with the writing on of the priests so that we know who they all are. And this below is actually gold from tomb KV39, which is believed to be the tomb of the Pharaoh Amenhotep I, who, along with his mother, started the Valley of the Kings. Um, and this was found in that tomb um, and may have been um, part of the gold, just missed, it's fairly small, uh, by the priests as they were exploiting uh, the royal mummies. Um, and another of the mummies who was, uh, another of the individuals who was actually a contemporary of Nessie Moons was Horam Knessi, um, and he's interesting because I've studied him at Bristol. Uh, they knew each other and we actually have Horeb Kinesi's handwriting. So the sort of quite personal stories on these two, we know quite um, a bit about them, which I think is helpful. And within that, we know um, that part of Nezia Moon's role would have been um, incantations um, chanted, uttered within the temple walls as part of his role. Uh, and although documents on what they were up to is it, it can be tricky, um, by the time of um, the Ptolemaic period in the first century BC, first century AD, um, we can get a little bit of information. And so the Greek commentator, uh, Demetrius, um, um, comments, um, in, in, in Egypt, the priests, when singing hymns in praise of the gods, employed the seven vowels, which they utter in due succession. Uh, and the sound of these letters is so euphonious uh, that men listen to it in preference to flute and lyre, which is interesting. Uh, and also appropriate that the vowels are mentioned given what we were hoping to do. And of course, in death, Nessie Moon uh, was mummified uh, to a fairly high status, uh, a brain removed, uh, inter internal organs removed, covered in dry, dry, dry nature on salt to dry out the body uh, and covered in, um, covered in oils and resins. Um, the study that was carried out in 1824 and published in 1828 
talks of spicery and supposedly identifying cinnamon and cassia, which could be smelt and also myrrh. Um, and this might fit with the fact that he, one of his roles, he also acted as an incense bearer. So that may have given him access to um, Canak stores of imported resin, even at this difficult, challenging time. And his body was then wrapped in uh, very tightly um, in linen. Um, and interestingly, within his wrappings of his upper, upper body, uh, it was encircled with two garlands, of lotus petals and red berries, and a red leather amulet or mummy brace, which was quite normal at this time, but naming the King Ramesses XI. Sadly, that was lost during the Second World War bombing. Um, but, um, but we at least have that record. Uh, and 70 days after the, uh, the death of Nessie Amun, his mummified body would have been taken to, to, for burial in the West. Again, at, at Daryl Bakri, as we've seen. And the mummy would have stood upright and the opening of the mouth ceremony performed, uh, a crucial part of the whole process, to allow Nessie Amun soul to breathe again, to eat and to drink, but also to speak his name before the gods of the underworld. So his need to speak in the afterlife uh, and for forever uh, was a very important part of what he felt he needed. And then normally the coffin was laid flat. This is generally, of course, and with Nezia Moon as well, in a small rock cut tomb and almost certainly an existing tomb reused for this purpose at this time, uh, which was common practice, as I say, by now. And so again, just going back to Nezia Moon's name because of the importance of it um, and the importance of saying his name, um, because to say his name is to make him live again, as well as him speaking himself. Uh, the name was extremely important. And um, as part of this opening of the mouse ceremony, um, once having passed through into the next world, it was essential for the soul um, that the deceased was able to speak, as I say, um, for, for the negative confession. Um, and in doing so, revealing his name, of course. Uh, and with the um, epithet, um, truer voice, which uh, Nezia Moon applied to himself. Uh, meaning that he spoke the truth and what he said could be relied upon um, and that he led a good life. And um, so this gave us the context for being interested in an individual where we know a fair amount about him. And if any are interested, that link there actually provides the sound of the ancient Egyptian language. Of course, this is challenging because of what we know, but that um, is, um, you know, is London, uh, and it does show that um, although there are challenges, uh, we can have, start to have some idea of how the ancient language might have sound, sounded. So again, relevant for this project, Again, just to reiterate um, that Nezia Moon was part of um, the world's first interdisciplinary study of an Egyptian mummy. And so um, had got quite a lot of interest, interest in him already. Uh, this is the, the um, first page of the account. Um, and so several studies have been done on him and so it seemed fitting in terms of his soul, his spirit, to um, continue to allow him to speak again, figuratively through the science, what that might reveal, um, and, that, um, and specifically uh, the possibility of, of maybe um, recreating uh, his voice that particularly relevant to these, the spells, the incantations that he would have uttered and it's worrying that for a decade 
we'd actually worked with um, an Egyptian Egyptologist whose expertise are in the language, language linguistics. And his particular interest is actually the uh, incantations, the, the utterances within the temple walls. Um, and that's some way down as far as the project goes, but this was um, why a, a number of things that came together as part of this project. And so it was to the point where Nezi Moon was about to um, go on his next um, scientific journey. Um, and so at this point, I'll um, hand you over to, um, to David Howard. Thank you. Hello. I trust you can hear me all right. And what I want to do is to pick up where Stephen's left off. And this first slide takes us to the scanner in Leeds General Hospital. And there is some of the first views of the scan coming up on that computer screen. That's me in the blue shirt. And um, that was to give us some idea whether or not it would be possible to consider recreating the voice. And what I want to do is to rehearse with you what one needs for human voice production and therefore how we might go about achieving this in practice. So the idea was to create a sound from Nezia Mun's vocal tract and by vocal tract we mean the um, spaces between the larynx in the neck and the lips. And the points to note here is that in order to do this we do need some soft tissue. We can't do it straight from a skeleton because of course the skeleton is pure bone and the vocal tract is based on soft tissue. So um, in this particular case, the soft tissue is essentially intact, except for the tongue, which we'll see in a moment, I describe as being desiccated, which basically has thinned it down. And that is a caveat to this work. And the soft tissue is fixed stationary, which is useful. Um, but of course, when we make a sound with a stationary soft tissue, we get a stationary sound, i.e. we get a sound that isn't changing. And I just leave you with the thought on that, that if the sound doesn't change, then it's no use for communication. If I don't change my vocal sound, of course, I'm not giving you any information apart from one piece of information, whatever the sound is that I can make. So this is, to a great degree, a proof of concept. Is it possible to do this at all? Now, to get there, I just want to very quickly rehearse with you the human voice production system. This is my um, model that I often employ. We basically have two lungs and in the neck we have um, two vocal folds. And then there is this tube which comes to the lips. And also there's a tube which goes to the nose, which is not relevant to this particular work. Um, many of the sounds in English, this valve is closed and we're dealing with the, the uh, mouth cavity. Um, and we describe these typically as the power source down here, the activity of the lungs pushing air, the sound source, the vibrations, the vocal folds, and then the sound before it reaches the outside world is modified. So as I'm talking to you now, my jaw is moving, my lips are moving, my tongue's moving, and that is what allows me to create the sounds of the English language, and hopefully it's making some sense. So specifically for this project, we're dealing with this part. We're dealing with a sound source and a mouth. Now, if this is um, not entirely new in the sense that Baron von Kempelin back at the end of the 18th century in about 1791, created a speaking machine. And this speaking machine looked like this and it contained um, some lungs with the bellows, a little reed in here and a a leather bag here, a leather tube, which was the tract. And I offer this simply as a very simple model, which is relevant to what we are doing. It also had some other features for doing some um, sh and sounds, but that's not relevant at the moment. And this is how it's played. You put the um, bellows under the arm and you squeeze the box. So here's a quick sound from this device, which I require the arrow in order to play. <laughs> Okay, so that's a 1791 speaking machine. I mean, it's a replica that was made about 30 years ago, but it's a, um, an accurate replica of the original. 
And you'll notice from that, there's a sort of buzzing sound, which is the um, vocal fold vibration, but those are absolutely at the same frequency. There's no pitch change in this particular. So let's think a bit about the acoustics here. Um, when we speak, we create different sounds by changing the mouth shape. So um, from an acoustic point of view, the mouth shape creates an acoustic chamber which has different acoustic properties depending on the size sh and shape of the chamber. It's a bit like going into different rooms. So what we are creating with Nezia Moon is we are aiming to create the acoustic chamber that he has in his vocal tract as he lies in his tomb. And acoustically, there are some key features which I'll mention now because they're relevant to something I'm gonna show later. These peaks, which are different for the vowel E, which is the one on the left and the vowel R, which has a more open mouth on the right here. And these peaks move around as we change the shape. And those are the peaks that our ears are very sensitive to and can pick up. So as I speak to you now, my peaks are moving around because my tongue and jaw and lips are moving. And you're hearing speech because you're hearing those peaks moving around. So these are called formants in the speech world, and those are the key elements acoustically that we're gonna take a brief look at later on. So what I wanted to just share with you was what does the voice source sounds like? Because we can't engage Nezuman's voice source. His larynx um, does not function anymore. And I wanna just um, share with you this thing, which is a, an artificial larynx. It sounds like this. And I can use this as a larynx and put it onto my um, neck and create some sounds. So I'm putting this buzz into the neck at the point where the vocal folds work and then moving my vocal tract around and you can hear the sound changing. The formants are changing. That is what you're dealing with. And this is the principle behind the Nezia Moon work. So we are trying to create. Firstly, we need a realistic electronic sound source. We can't use this um, buzzer, but what um, we can do is to create that electronically. And the one that's being used, if you know about these, is called the LF, the Lillian-Krantz FANT model, which is commonly used in electronic speech synthesizers. We need a way to connect it to the vocal tract, and we need a way to change its pitch. If you don't change the pitch, the sound is very non-natural, as the um, von Kempler machine demonstrated earlier. So, comparing what we do today with the von Kempler machine, we have a larynx source, which is the reed inside the von Kempelin machine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop doing that. Sorry, I realize you can't, I don't think, see this arrow, so I need the pointer. So the reed is in here, and I have a loudspeaker onto which we can put vocal tracts, and you can create a sound into the larynx source, and you then hear whatever the tract is dealing with. So what you're seeing on the screen here is a 3D printed vocal tract here, and I'll explain how we get those in just a moment, put alongside a mannequin just to show where it is in the head. So the head is actually behind that, it's just simply for illustration purposes. And this is how we get from a scan to this vocal tract. So here's a vocal tract on the left, you can see the lips, you can see the tongue, there's the tube, there are various bits of tubing down here that we're not gonna worry about today. And we get these from a 3D scan looking in the three dimensions of a scan from a CT scanner. So that's what we're aiming to get. And just for illustration purposes, there's a modern R vowel and a modern E vowel. And under here where my red pointer is, is where your tongue would be. For the E, it's hunched upwards. For the R, it's down and hunched backwards. But those are the things that allow us to make different sounds. So I've created in my other work, a thing I call the vocal tract organ, which is a way of creating a sound source to a loudspeaker onto which you can plug a vocal tract. So that's a key part of the um, apparatus. And this is how it 
can be controlled. It has a volume and a pitch control on a joystick and a vibrato rate and depth control on the other joystick because it's designed for singing. And this is the key diagram which shows Nezia Moon's scans. So everything in white and gray on these pictures relate directly to his anatomy. Everything in red relates to where the airway has been established. And this is his mouth. Uh, this is his chin. There's the brain. The back of the head has been removed. And um, the red part here is the airway from the larynx region to the lips. And what I said earlier about the tongue is this white part here, which I'm tracing, which is slightly protruding from the bottom lip as he lies in his um, coffin. That is faithfully represented in the 3D model. And once you have established the airway in three dimensions, this is a side view, um, this is a front view, and that's a sort of top-down view, you can then create a model, which is what this red thing is bottom left. This is a solid, in inverted commas, model of the airway. Now, of course, a solid model isn't actually what we want. What we want is a hollow model. So um, just a few caveats. I've mentioned the tongue. I'll also mention here where the soft palate normally is in the top of the mouth. It's missing. So um, that was um, shaded across, as it were, to create um, not a space here, but to um, complete the vocal tract. And then from this shape, we can then get to the airway. So in order to do that, first of all, we have um, the uh, shape here, which when you um, grow the shape in the computer, you also need to let it come out of the mouth so that you can get the outside features, the lip and lips and the tongue. And in order to make a sound with it, we have to basically put a sheath around the airway. And here you can see the tongue and you can see the lips. So inside here is hollow. This is hollow. And um, we put this coupler, this round coupler on the bottom, which fits over the loudspeaker. In practice, we 3D print these in two pieces. That's simply to allow us to clear out the supporting material which um, goes inside it, because otherwise you can't clear out the narrow gaps, particularly down in this in the bottom area. Sorry, I realize you can't see that. In the bottom area here, there's a very narrow gap which represents the gap between the vocal folds. So here is um, a set of photographs. Actually, I have the track with me. It's um, here in my camera shot. This is the um, tract, Nessia Mun's tract. It has a coupler there for a loudspeaker. You can see the tongue, I think. You can see the tongue, you can see into the mouth. And if I turn it sideways, you can see the tongue just sticking out. So that's what it looks like. Um, there are the um, coupled loudspeaker. This is the um, controlling system that was used. And um, I suspect everybody has heard this sound, but this is the sound. You'll notice it's on a falling pitch. If you don't use a pitch change, then um, it sounds very unnatural. So the pitch change does make a significant difference. The tract, of course, is solid. It is not soft tissue, it's hard. I mean, it's made of, it's hard, but nevertheless, it's a bit like an eggshell. The, these are quite delicate because they're not particularly thick, um, but uh, it is not moving. Thank you. Come on, move, thank you. So in acoustic terms, we typically look at these things called spectrograms. And I'm showing you this because it allows us to just check the acoustic output against what we know about um, modern sounds. Now, um, the formant peaks I mentioned earlier are the dark areas on the spectrogram. And this bottom one is called a narrowband spectrogram. It shows harmonics. And the top one is called a wideband spectrogram. And the formant peaks are measured like that. And what we did in order to um, get some idea whether they had any bearing on speech that we know about was first of all to plot the spectrum 
as a line plot. So this dark connected black line is Nezia Moon's output. And these are the formant peaks. There's the first formant, there's the second, there's the third, and there's the fourth. And we did a direct comparison because th that vowel sound um, is somewhere between the modern E vowel and the modern A vowel, as in the words bad and bed, as shown down here. So we got six males to record those sounds and took the average formant frequencies for those six males and plotted them as plus signs and X's on this graph to show that, yes, the first formant somewhere between them, the second formant is close to the bed, the third formant actually completely line up, and the fourth formant is probably also close to the bed sound. So, I mean, but we are comparing, not like with like, we're comparing a mummified sound with um, uh, modern vowels. And of course the tongue is not um, properly set up in Nezumun's track for the reasons I've mentioned already, but it was to give some sense that we are dealing with a plausible speech sound. So there are the formants. So, out of curiosity, um, we're doing some work actually to see whether we can do a fly through of vocal tracts. Um, this isn't Menezjumun, this is um, uh, a different tract, but we've managed to export this to Minecraft, which for those of you that uh, use Minecraft, which I don't, but um, my student assures me that uh, this is an interesting thing to do. Um, Minecraft accepts these models and you can then what's called voxelize these models and completely out of interest, but this is not to um, uh, say anything other than we can now make a Lego model of a vocal tract. And one of the reasons we're thinking this might be important, firstly, the scale of this model is crazy because it's about 30 centimeters tall in order to be made with Lego bricks, but it's all about trying to um, engage young people in the notion of being able to vocally model things. So this is not Nezia Moon, this is um, um, me actually. Um, so um, that's the basis of the work that we did. And I just wanna say something briefly about the paper itself, because to be honest, certainly for me, this completely um, took me by huge surprise. So we published this paper on the 23rd of January, 2020. And in terms of where I was, we thought, okay, we've published the paper, let's get on with other things. Let's see if the museum gets more visitors. But it wasn't really like that. Um, this is a plot of the downloads of that paper in the first month. That's the first 30 days. And here is the Y axis. We are talking about um, in that first month, over 300,000 downloads. And if we extrapolate that, um, looking at what happened at the time, this was the Guardian's uh, list of most popular things. We were number six in that month. If we extrapolate it to today, we're now on 363,000. Um, and this is crazy to my mind. Um, uh, we've also, in the last um, week, we're in the top 100. We're paper number two in the top 100 of um, this particular publication's uh, outputs. And this for me says something about the sheer popularity of anything to do with Egyptian mummies. I think what we've demonstrated is that it is possible to recreate a sound, but as a voice scientist, I would caveat that with it is a sound and it is the sound that happens to be the one that emerges from the um, vocal tract as he lies in his sarcophagus, but it does have a link with modern speech, as I've shown. Um, here's an interesting French one. They've made a, um, a children's uh, uh, activity out of it in French to talk about uh, how things go. And we've been interviewed for all kinds of outlets. And let me finally just show you something which completely staggers me. This came from the University of York Press Office in March 2020 of something they call the reach of the work. I don't know how it's calculated, maybe somebody can enlighten me, but this is the number. The online readership was quoted as being that number. That's 2.3 billion people who have somehow been linked with the reach of this work. And to put that into context, that is about a third of the Earth's population. 
Now, I, I, I struggle with this number, um, but it's just a mind-blowing statistic. So, I believe we have demonstrated the possibility of creating a vowel. It's based on the extant vocal tract. It's certainly raised awareness of voice science to the masses. It's certainly raised Lee's Museum's numbers. It's demonstrated huge global interest in work to do with mummies. And some of the things we're sort of thinking about is, um, it was mentioned earlier by Stephen that Nezia Moon sang. And um, we at least have the basis of his vocal tract. This is a question, might it be possible to articulate this track in the virtual world in a way that is um, commensurate with speaking or singing? And I mentioned singing because I personally am particularly interested in singing and the um, phonetics of singing, etc. And at that point, I'd like to thank you very much for coming along this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Stephen and David there for a fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Don Watt. I'll just make my video go on. Hi. Um, and I'll be handling the Q&A session. And with your permission, since we're running a little bit behind time, if we go to 20 to 8, I hope that's OK. Of course, you're free to leave the call whenever you like. So we have a fair few questions here. I'll start with a couple to Stephen. Uh, we have a question asking, uh, have we been able to identify how or what Nessia Moon died from or with? Um, no, not, not, um, not at the moment, no. Um, but we're going to look at him again in a number of different ways, so um, yeah, we'll see. But, um, um, there's nothing definite. I mean, there have been things suggesting he had quite a rich diet, a lot of beef, and, and that may have had an impact on his health. But um, it, it's like most of us, it can be a number of factors that actually are the reason why we, we die. So um, there's nothing obvious, which sometimes there can be, but um, yeah, there isn't anything. Missing. Okay, thank you. Um, Crystal is asking, why was the back of Nessia Moon's head removed? Steve. Good question. Um, I think it, it reflects the approach that was taken at the time where it was quite a medical approach. Um, and the history of, of looking at Egyptian mummies through a medical perspective has been enlightening to some extent, but there's also been a certain amount of butchery. Uh, there's someone called Douglas Derry who actually was involved in Tutankhamun uh, and removed his, his, his mummy with, with hot knives because he was stuck to the coffin. Uh, but he did some other, other uh, interesting work with, with finely mummified queens um, and basically um, defleshed them. Um, in the case of Nezia Moon, um, there may have been some uh, medical interest in in looking at the brain, perhaps. Um, I don't know 100% off, off the top of my head, but certainly I do know that the approach in 1824 was a, a relatively invasive one, which was relatively normal for the time, really. Okay, we have another question relating to the, the head and brain. This is from Margaret, who says articles in New Scientist refer to the brain as being cranial offal in Egyptian parchments. Is this because the brain, white and coiled, looked like the intestines? Yes, that's quite possible, yeah. The only, yeah, that's quite possible. The only thing I'd add to that as well, though, is there, is, there has been this idea that the brain was, was removed and discarded, um, which you could argue is, is the fact that they had a, a healthy sense of cynicism. They hadn't used the brain in life, so why would they need it in the afterlife? Uh, but perhaps that's, that's me. But slightly more seriously, um, they'd actually kept swabs of the body nearby because that contained uh, an element of the individual. So if they're doing that, they won't have literally thrown the brain away. Uh, what we might be looking at is that they might have been put in vessels that haven't been looked at particularly closely, um, which is an in, in, interest to mine because me because I'm a chemist and brain chemistry is very 
distinctive and specific and I'm working on that more generally, not just with Egyptian mummies. Um, and so we could have answer, answers to that. But yes, that resemblance, it could, could well be the case. It would be quite ancient Egyptian in that respect. Thanks. And maybe one more relating to the, the body of Nesimun itself. Um, Amy is asking, was his tongue stinging out, sticking out of the mouth for a reason or yeah. just part of the mummification process? If we're honest, we don't know for sure. He's not the only one to have this, which has been said by some, but that's not true. Um, and there have been various theories which are not particularly convincing from my perspective that he may have been um, stung by a bee, for example, is one is one that's put forward. But I think for me that there, that there are too many possible explanations, one being possibly connected to the particular uh, approach of the embalmers, um, that I don't think we can be sure if we're being reasonable and scientific about it, unfortunately. It's a good question, but in my view, we don't know. Okay, well, maybe sticking with the tongue, uh, we have a question about the vowels that were chanted that were mentioned um, in one of the quotes that you gave. Um, and I guess either of you might want to address this. What, what are the seven vowels of ancient Egyptian? Uh, being quite honest, I'm not sure. It's interesting given the number of vowels we have and those seven vowels. Uh, but I'm not um, uh, a linguist and, and hieroglyphs aren't my expertise, which is precisely why we've got an Egyptian Egyptologist where that is exactly where they are uh, an expert. Um, so I'm sure I could go away and find out, but to be honest, I don't know. David, have Very you got a... Yeah. Sorry about that, which is a bit disappointing, I, I realise. David, is that something you can comment on? What, what, Sorry, what I was I was answering a question in the chat. Um, remind me of the question you want. The the vowels of ancient Egyptian, the the yes, lines. I, I, I'm sorry, no, I don't know. No, I don't know. That's um, no, that's out with my um, my area. It's my understanding. I I know very little about this, I'm afraid. But the the vowels of ancient Egyptian weren't actually written down. So it, yeah, that's right. The they tend to be consonants, yeah, the, the, the symbols. Um, mm. a, um, a reed or feather is connected with, with I, but, but um, certainly, and you can argue that the quail chick is, is a, a U as well as a W, uh, but, but yes, certainly um, the vowels, like um, Hebrew, from what I understand, that the vowels simply aren't um, there. Okay, thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions relating to whether it's possible to apply these same techniques to a living person. I can say that um, the work that we did in terms of creating the vowel was based on work that had been done previously, in fact, while I was at York, comparing the vowels of living people who we then put into the MRI machine and did exactly the same with them and compared their vowels directly with um, the equivalent vowel of them making the sound lying down as if they were in the MRI machine wearing headphones that had the MRI machine noise and the um, results were exceptionally close to each other. So we are um, convinced that this methodology is working well. The key thing acoustically, as I said in the talk, is to make sure that the input to the vocal tract is realistic, i.e. It's, it's a model that, um, that's closely allied to what the vocal folds create when they vibrate in normal speech. As a follow-up question, I suppose, to that, um, were the vocal tests that you ran using vowels from, from living speakers? Um, were they of similar ethnic origin to Nesiamun? No, no, they, they were um, uh, students at the University of York. Um, okay, um, somebody called Claire wants to know more about the tongue desiccation factor, what, what kind of limitation that imposed and, and how could you overcome that? Stephen, can you? 
Well, uh, yeah, although I would have thought that, that ultimately that's a question for you. I mean, obviously the, the, t- the tongue will be desiccated to some extent, as is other parts of the body. Um, and that's part of both the embalming process and to some extent the environment that Thebes looks for, which is very um, dry, very arid. Okay. Um, but so the key you- question is then what, what, difference does it make from the sound's point of view? Uh, Right, so uh, absolutely. Well, the tongue um, basically sorts out the lower edge of the vocal tract airway because the tongue sits on the bottom um, of the tract and therefore it will change the acoustics of the tract being in the condition it's in. Um, And I think the, the way to interpret it is that the sound that we've created is the sound that we would make if he was to phonate, i.e. turn his larynx on, as he lies in his sarcophagus, in his coffin. Um, it is not a sound that necessarily he would have created himself. So as a proof of concept, this is to see whether you can get from um, the um, sarcophagus to the tract in order to create a sound. So to put that into context, if we were to try and create a word, for example, or another vowel, we would have to do something to build some bulk into the tongue and also control, control in inverted commas, I mean, in the virtual domain, the jaw and the lip movement, but particularly the jaw movement. So in terms of synthesis, if we're going to try and copy somebody's voice, then one would need a realistic tongue. Yeah, and presumably that's something though you're looking at because there's a reason why I asked that that's relevant. I mean, with facial reconstructions, They've obviously tended to be done from from bony the the, the bone basically the, the skull, uh, and so things like the nose and the ear and the lips are subjective. And I do know that um, Professor Peter Venesis and, and his wife um, have um, been have had an interest in looking at using soft tissue on mm-hmm. mummies um, and using that information to give a better recreation of the individual, and basically pumping up what is left yeah. uh, in terms of modeling. So I don't know whether there are sort of similar things could perhaps be done. And it is quite challenging, of course, but whether similar things could be done with, with the tongue and in, in, in this context. Yes, I think in principle they, they can, because in the 3D modeling world, you can model it like plasticine if you want to, mm-hmm. you can add to it and so on. Um, what you'd have to have is some way of knowing what the bulk might look like. But then um, I think there would be evidence in terms of just normal human tongues versus the vocal tract space. So I think there would be markers which would allow one to get a pretty good idea about what the bulk of the tongue would be like. Sure. Well, thank you both very much. Um, We have quite a few other questions. Unfortunately, I did say that we would draw a a line at uh, 20 to 8 and that time has come, alas. But I'll I'll pass over now to Peter French again just to... to, um, wrap up proceed. yeah well look i mean absolutely fantastic performance thank you very much really interesting findings i mean that's attested by the fact i think we've had about 270 or so participants all sitting in online a very very good crop of questions massive interest in this area um the figures that you gave us about downloading and um and reader statistics, David, were mind-boggling. Um, <laughs> um, a third of the world's population. I mean, I, I wouldn't know anything else that could claim that of modern-day origin, but uh, fantastic. And thank you again for coming along.